with Isabella's trek around ooh, uh, the home counties. No, it's not the home counties, it's the native states. Perhaps it should have been the home counties because uh, she was not necessarily enjoying it and yet at the same time she was enjoying it but uh, uh, you know it, it was a bit of a bit of a hard trek uh, typing the f named heavenly peace by uh, captain Speezy, as we have already mentioned and uh, perhaps i should use this moment to remind people that uh, if they're dropping into the story right now uh, they might well have missed quite a lot of the points that I was making on the way uh, and you can go uh, and find the whole of this, this story over at lawrencegray.net slash travel with a capital T and if you want to go further you can go slash blog hyphen two but uh, if you just go lawrencegray.net slash travel with a capital T uppercase T too other people who you know, use a printing convention as opposed to a old-fashioned pen scribing convention never mind about that anyway you can you can see the whole whole lot from uh, episode one to episode two episode three and so on and so forth and uh, my, you know I, I was finding my way into this blog myself because it's a vlog about a blog and this should have been a documentary series we, we, we were going to go out and uh, film it we had the script all, all lined up but Covid came in and destroyed the plans and I thought well I've done all this damn research so um, I might as well use it in some fashion so I'm using it now right so I've written down the blog it's more detailed probably more coherent storyline but for those of you who don't want to read uh, and can put up with my rather <clears throat> croaky voice which has been plaguing me all the time I've been doing this then uh, well here I am right ready to tell you right this moment because the story of the Ballad of Nahi Ibrahim right so uh, Isabella's are now arrived in Taiping now Taiping as you well well know from previous episodes was renamed uh, Tai uh, was was named Taiping by Captain Speedy it used to be La Route now then uh, he called it Taiping because well uh, La Route was a notoriously violent place where thousands of people had been murdered and the entire place had been burnt down uh, and there were only two houses left standing by this conflagration of violence uh, that um, poor old Captain Speedy really had a task on uh, trying to keep under control but now it was all under control and it was being rebuilt and so he renamed it Taiping uh, largely to enable uh, them to pitch this to various investors I do believe who, who would have heard of La Rude and said oh I'm not putting on any of that place but Taiping Heavenly Peace well that sounds a great place doesn't it yes Heavenly Peace yeah I'd go and live there and even now it's uh, classified as the the happiest town in Malaya how did it get that name I do not know if you go to uh, uh, Taiping now and uh, especially if you walk around in the dark where it's a bit under uh, lit and there are huge holes where the drainage covers should be and there are no pavements and uh, in the dark you can quite easily disappear into one of those and uh, uh, that would be the end of your holiday it would totally ruin your holiday uh, but don't worry yeah you, you you finding somewhere to get really drunk is probably pretty hard there so uh, perhaps the sobriety of people walking around at night is the thing that limits the number of people that fall into the ma into the vast drainage holes a anyway that's my complaint about the place it was just hard work walking around you had to watch your step one falter faltering step and you were into the gutter and swept down the drains and that would be the last of of you and uh, when uh, Isabella arrived uh, in that area uh, the first thing she heard was that some poor old British tax uh, uh, collector had uh, got hacked to pieces by the local Chinese so perhaps it wasn't quite as typing uh, even when she arrived in fact her dreams were becoming increasingly more vivid uh, she kept thinking that people are going to slaughter her in her beds she, she began to get the the general paranoia of the uh, of the British residents that uh, uh, 
she found herself uh, uh, mingling with. Uh, anyway, let's go back to now, Ibrahim, I've mentioned him before, you probably know the full story. He's the uh, the Bessar Mentri, or the Mentri Bessar. Uh, I, I haven't looked it up for a while, uh, but it's one of those, it, which basically means the, the big minister, the grand minister of La Route, or, or he was. But uh, this, we're going back in time here. Uh, so he, he's, he's the son of uh, Long Jafar, who uh, set up the, uh, the, the little fiefdom and, and uh, founded the mine in uh, uh, the tin mines and what have you there. Apparently uh, he saw all the, the ore stuck to the side of the legs of his elephant. And I think the, the elephant was called Larut. So let's call this place La Route, they said. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, anyway, you can go to the museum at uh, Kota Naibrim in Taiping. It's a grand museum. Uh, you'll love it. Um, lots of rather lurid pictures of Chinese hacking each other to pieces, uh, which, of course, uh, is, is something that uh, uh, they call them gangsters. Uh, I thought that was an interesting term that they used. Uh, anyway, the uh, problems with La Route uh, required... Uh, uh, now you him to hire Captain Speedy, that, that was the basis of that. Now then, uh, two things um, made uh, uh, La Route's rather dodgy area. So, so it was, now Ibrahim was a pri had a privileged upbringing. He was the son of a very rich man. And uh, consequently, the problem with these privileged individuals is that um, in traditional societies, it doesn't really matter because everybody just owes them allegiance and and they put up with their whims and uh, and they have um, kind of traditional advisors uh, uh, whispering to other people. So well, he'll forget about it tomorrow. I'll just make sure. I'll nudge him and so on and so forth. Uh, so there, there's a, there's a certain amount of tolerance for the mad, the bad, and the ill-educated and uh, uh, and the willful and the uh, just. Well, in fact, in fact, if you if you're the son of a uh, traditional ruler, uh, you're expected to be arrogant. You're expected to be uh, largely concerned with uh, passing on your genes so that the uh, the the kingdom, so to speak, can be uh, uh, the wealth can be kept within the family. And the family is an extended family with a lot of people uh, with a vested interest in keeping you alive, despite your idiocy. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the problem with traditional uh, ruling setups is that um, very often the guy at the at the uh, later generations of such a family are, are totally crazy and insane and inbred and uh, uh, haven't been brought up in that system. They just go crazy. I mean, look at the British royal family. Look at Harry and Meghan, for instance. There you go. Harry's just so driven insane. I I can never ever amount to being king unlike my brother. And of course uh, in the uh, traditional societies if we go back to the warrior cultures uh, so, uh, that would mean hmm, I can be king if I kill my brother. Oh my brother's a complete pain in the ass. Well Harry can't kill his brother but he can go on opera and uh, you know really put this of stick into the uh, into the system, just to stick it to the man. Uh, as, uh, you see, traditional rulers, traditional ways of uh, uh, organising society, uh, they're all terribly brutal. Uh, so, now Abraham was one of those guys, and he was straggling this modernity and tradition uh, cusp. And, well, if you remember, I mentioned about history being about uh, telling us what can happen and that all these visions of the future that one may have brought about by extrapolating local uh, technology uh, into the future to see how it, much of it, it will change our lives and improve uh, and how so often that just doesn't pan out and in fact uh, it's just a little increment a little bit different from what things were well uh, one of the things about history it moves a lot slower than you can imagine so what was happening in 1870s pretty much is not too dissimilar to what's happening now. People are still struggling that uh, modernity, traditional uh, kind of output. You know, uh, th this assumes that there's a modernity. What the hell does modernity mean? Modernity means uh, uh, living within a technological and economic and political structure that has arisen around our uh, distribution of 
resources. And um, that distribution of resources uh, and the demand for those resources uh, is dependent upon a scientific basis, right? facts that are derived from experience, experience that's been analysed in a uh, logical and coherent fashion, which has been through a system of uh, scientific uh, um, institutions, so to speak, uh, methodology. Uh, it's, it's a rag bag of various ideas and elements, of course, uh, and, and people are always trying to get a, a through line as to what it exactly means. Um, and so consequently, uh, there are traditional forms of uh, doing much the same sort of thing. But for instance, um, traditional Chinese medicine based upon traditional Persian medicine, I hasten to add in many ways. Um, um, and a, a lot of their ideas came out of Central Asia and, uh, and Islamic culture, uh, indeed, uh, was highly influential um, in, in, in all this. Um, that area, they did look at things, they recorded things, they said, oh, after this, then that, after this, then that. However, they didn't, they jumped to all sorts of weird conclusions. The I Ching, for instance, uh, was uh, what Confucius said, I was going to study the I Ching, because, you know, if you throw the bones and you come up with these figures, uh, and they kind of, they must be a reflection of the heavens, and the heavens uh, are determining what we uh, are and so they must be a reflection of the moment the tide uh, so that we can move with the tide we can uh, perhaps prepare ourselves so it was like weather forecast and, and of course as you know our accurate weather forecast it may say it's raining uh, but where you live now nah, now nah. it might be raining in the general area but where you live now nah. yeah. uh, statistics modern statistics will actually look closely at uh, these these elements and, and give you all kind of uh, um, figures that tell you the likelihood of the likelihood. It's, it, it gets very complicated. We can go off into uh, quantum mechanics and what, what have you, uh, where if, even uh, logic breaks down and it just becomes statistical, um, which I know a lot of uh, traditional societies, uh, they're sciences and all that are statistical it's just that their statistical analysis is is more uh, anecdotal uh, anyway i'm digressing i'm going all over the place but uh, you, you get the idea and so history tells us uh, it moves very very slowly and the political fault lines of 100 years ago are pretty much what we have today uh 200 years ago yeah they're pretty much I, when i refer to history i always refer back to uh, uh naturally to british history and uh, colonial history and uh, Europe and so on um, but uh, it's it's the same uh, I've done a bit of reading about Chinese history and Japanese history of course uh, you know, I've lived in China for uh, 24 years uh, it's so I'm kind of uh, see there's there's a f uh, there's something familiar about the Chinese ebb and flow of activity uh, and political um, development. And I, I, and I often think when I'm looking at uh, the Ming Dynasty that uh, it's very, very modern. I recognise this. They had chat shows. I mean, you, you, you'd, have, you'd have a conference that uh, people were invited to uh, come along and watch. And, uh, and so they'd bring in the speakers up, up the rivers and they'd drink and have a, uh, have a good old time. And the people were uh, diametrically opposed opinions would come and discuss them in front of the public and people would cheer uh, their philosophers and they flog their books and they had a um, they had a good postal service that was sending things things out and you had an Amazon set up uh, in a Ming dynasty um, and I'm, I'm pretty certain uh, if we go to a, even earlier dynasties uh, you, you'll find something similar going on there. Uh, you go back to the Tang. The Tang was all, all, always in, uh, very kind of uh, interesting, uh, largely because the, it was very Central Asian rather than Han as such. The Tang did see, uh, was a kind of a, a confluence of Turkish influence and Chinese. The Turks and uh, it's, it's, it's why Kashgar and that Western China area is, is always seen as part of China because that's really where that Tang dynasty began to develop and uh, in with their allegiance to the uh, uh, to the emperor the Han emperor uh, anyway I'm, I've, got, 
I know, all over the place. But remember, history moves very slowly. Uh, Chinese have a good sense of that history, although they're losing it, I have to say. They're, um, they were, one has to remember, as, as all, all Chinese do remember, uh, dynasties come and dynasties go. That's just the way it is. Well, like I said, in Britain, if you look for the politics of the day, a uh, bit of history about the, uh, the British uh, Civil War in the 1660s, <clears throat> and you'll find that uh, much of the debate that uh, uh, class divisions and regional divisions, uh, <clears throat> philosophical divisions, and so it's all there. It's all there. It's socialism and radicalism and uh, religion and uh, uh, and atheism. Uh, so it's 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 all there in that 17th century Britain, and we're still doing it uh, there. Diff what's radically changed in Britain is is our uh, ethnic makeup. Um, we've had a uh, huge influx of people from the old colonial empire uh, and uh, they've brought some of their politics with it and that makes things interesting. It's moved things on a little bit in, in not necessarily in, in all sorts of different directions. Right. So I say modernity, traditional, uh, it's, it's difficult to find too but essentially what we're seeing here, here is uh, uh, a warrior culture is now confronted with what can only be uh, considered to be a, a culture that crea was created in the, the suburbs of Victorian England, where uh, the middle classes, <clears throat> with their accountants and their lawyers and their uh, uh, investment brokers, all conspired to uh, demand resources from Malaya and that gave opportunities for huge amounts of money to be made if one knew what to do and our uh, Ibrahim made a huge amount of money so he obviously knew quite a bit of what to do but the politics around him was murderous and uh, he found himself supporting um, Sultan Ismail in that uh, um, succession dispute over the Parak throne. Uh, he supported the traditionist Ismail. He, he, he was the rightful heir because he was there at the funeral. He got the regalia. Uh, that was very important. And so we go along with him. And Abdullah, well, he, he had his moment. He had his chance and he should have been there. Uh, he should have understood the, uh, the right, uh, should have understood the traditional uh, position of the son of the Sultan. Uh, and that he wasn't necessarily going to inherit it. He should have understood that. But as uh, Sultan Abdullah had um, westernised in some respects. He'd, he had been hanging around with too many of the non-traditional types and he'd lost sense of what that tradition is and it kicked him in the arse, basically. Uh, so now Ibrahim was supporting Ismail and it was a natural support. He was just supporting whoever was in, in power at the time. It was just so easy to go along with it and Captain Speedy was uh, employed by him and uh, he was uh, he tidied up this mining town uh, you know, he was the sheriff in town. Let's just say a little bit about mining towns everywhere. Uh, it, it wasn't particularly a Chinese um, vice, this this uh, idea that it was about gambling and prostitutes and drug taking. Every mining town in, uh, in, in America yeah, it was the same. In Af Africa, in South Africa, yeah, the same thing was going, going on. And, and in Australia as well. Uh, it's true there was a hell of a lot of Chinese involved in uh, this. The Chinese were great miners. They, they, they knew what they were doing and they knew where the money was. And they worked hard. <clears throat> and uh, it, it's uh, their role in the opening up of the West and the opening up of Australia is, is grossly underplayed. Uh, it's, it's, largely, it's largely forgotten, though I, I did notice in Tasmania they, they were running tours uh, <clears throat> of the Chinese uh, mining system for f people who, whose relatives had come to Tasmania uh, to, uh, to mine the area and, and open up the country. Uh, you know. So it, it's, it's an opportunity and I, I think uh, and Australia has realised that as its uh, Chinese population increases, uh, well there's a lot of people interested in its, the Chinese heritage. Uh, even so, put a lot of men give them nothing to do but dig a hole and earn money and they're stuck in a muddy 
backwater with no other outlets away. Uh, some enterprising uh, guys bringing a bunch of uh, rather dopey opium adult young girls who they've uh, acquired somehow, um, probably uh, illicitly uh, or, or even, uh, you know, some sharp um, madams from other places that uh, they've recognised there's a career structure here and they've gone and they've set up their, their saloons, they've set up, set up their bars and they've set up their gambling. Uh, so, so, so it's gambling and prostitutes and drugs and uh, just perfect to keep these people digging holes because that money comes out of the ground into into their pockets and then out of that pockets into the owner uh, of all these uh, services to the miners and so, so and so forth. It's, it's, it's called economics and it's also hmm, a, a place where rival teams vie for the monopoly and in this case it was the uh, the hacker based uh, Heisan and the Cantonese based Gi Hin. Now the, uh, the the route was had, well, there were all sorts of uh, altercations that took place, but uh, the final chapter came when the um, Gi Hing, uh, head, head of the Gi Hing, ran off with the wife of the Hei San. Ah, yes, that uh, was it, or was it the other way around? I'm, 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 perhaps I'm, I'm jumping to conclusions there. Um, I have written it down, I have got confused. That's oh, right, it is the Gi Hing runs off with the Hei San's wife, yes. Yeah, that's right. And and um, the Heisan Hays, go on a killing spree, killing every single Gi Hing that they can come across, uh, uh, which frightens the Gi Hing. The Gi Hing hire 4,000 mercenaries, right? 4,000 mercenaries to come in and sort the Heisan out. And they go apeshit on the town, burning everything down, and they kick the Heisan out. The Heisan retreat to Penang, where they, uh, where they have several shootouts with uh, various Gi Hing. You can still see the bullet holes there there and there's a whole series of photos of uh, what the uh, ex-pack community had to do. They barricaded their streets up and they, they stood there with their guns and their cannons on their uh, end of the road. Uh, it, it, it was, you know, it was a, it was a, a disconcerting time uh, for, for a lot of people. Uh, anyway, they, they, go cra they go crazy, the whole place is, is burnt down. Uh, Isabella Bird says there were only two houses left standing. Now then, uh, actually, if you go and see those two houses, which are still there, you can't imagine that they were just left standing. You know, Nana like Ibrahim's house, why leave the boss man? You know, you don't want, if you're the enemy of him, you don't, you, you stick it to him as well, you know. Uh, ah, it's, uh, there's something a bit odd about uh, how blood curdlingly violent this, this whole uh, situation was portrayed as. Uh, it, it does seem to be a little bit more of a um, bit of a hype uh, to justify some of the British uh, activities in the region. Um, that's just my suspicion. I don't, but even so, it was still a pretty bad situation. Um, the uh, if you go to the museum, they call the, the triad gangsters. Now the the Hei San and the Gi Hing, although the Gi Hing were probably a, a bit more blood curdling than the Hei San, uh, and they took they had uh, blood oaths and slit in a chicken's throat and splatter it with you with blood to declare your you know, it's a bit like the freemasons you know roll up your trouser leg put a noose around your neck and uh, hold a knife at your throat yeah my father was a freemason well what do you expect he was a policeman uh, in the uk that's another story but <clears throat> uh, there's an association that most of these things they were also um uh, your welfare network you, you paid a certain amount of money into a, a fund which paid for your uh, hospitalization your hospital treatment uh, if you were unemployed you got unemployment benefit uh, in fact some of these um, uh, so-called secret societies they weren't that secret frankly um, so they, they'd set up uh, practically independent states uh, in in places in Borneo for instance in fact there was one of the one of the first uh, independent republics that was recognized by the American when they first became independent uh, was was in Borneo and it was a Chinese state um, and it ostensibly it lasted well into the uh, 20th century uh, when the Dutch finally uh, cl uh, closed it down uh, as, a, as an entity but um, you know uh, the, these things were um, they were 
almost democratic. In fact, uh, you had to vote that very often. The, the members uh, came and voted for your representative who went to the next level and he, he voted for his representative. The, the, you know, the, there was a, uh, well, the sort of democracy that you probably got in the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, now, that, that kind of uh, uh, committees sending representatives who then joined another committee and then they went up to the next level and then there's the inner politburo and so on and so forth it, it was it was kind of like that and i, I suspect that um, uh, very much you, you the chinese communist party's uh, uh, way of doing things was is is modeled upon these uh, uh, associations which we because we watched Cantonese movies, uh, Hong Kong movies, we, we, we assume they're all gangsters and such like. Well, they kind of were on occasions, uh, but uh, they were also sort of business associations, and many of these uh, associations did actually evolve into just uh, Chinese uh, business association, Chinese com commerce association, association of Chinese uh, commercial interests, whatever the terms that they were thrown in there, you know. Uh, uh, as opposed to Haksik Wui, uh, the black societies. Most of them weren't really Haksik Wui. Uh, so, right. Uh, oh, God, there were, um, back in Hong Kong, there was a notorious uh, uh, pronouncement by the chief of police in Guangzhou, which, which said, uh, triads, they're not triads. Uh, this was referring to several um, assassinations that were taking place around uh, uh, Macau at the time. Uh, triads, no. Uh, Patriots. <laughs> uh, everybody, everybody just had to laugh. Uh, you know. Uh, and, oh, that was another, another one where the, the policeman in uh, in Macau was saying, uh, "Oh, uh, it's perfectly safe to come to Macau. They just had these these assassination and shootings and what have you. They're perfectly safe to come to Macau. Our assassins are professionals. <laughs> they don't don't deal with uh, or the ordinary punter. So you're, you're perfectly safe." <laughs> <laughs> You're the laugh, haven't you? Uh, where was I? Right, back to Nah Ibrahim. Nah Ibrahim, uh, so he backs the, the wrong side, uh, essentially. Uh, and um, uh, what, what happens is that uh, the Pankar Treaty, where once again he tried to uh, muscle in there and show that he, he was the big boss, but I say he's, he's, he's the son of the guy who was the heavyweight, really. So he's not quite so heavy, and he gets bullied. By the British, despite the fact that he's got Captain Speedy there and he's got his uh, his British solicitor, he gets bullied into sitting down with all the others, and and from then on, then on his life just well, falls apart because uh, suddenly he now finds that uh, his employee, Captain Speedy, is, is his boss. His Captain Speedy's been elevated to the uh, the resident of the route, and poor old Nye Ibrahim's wondering what the hell to do at this point. Uh, well. Things get even worse because uh, the, the British have, uh, have taken over his house and they're trying everybody who was associated with the uh, uh, assassin, assassination of uh, James Birch. And because he was, he was back in East Ishmael, who, who was anti-British, uh, the, the assumption that Nye Ibrahim was anti-British, when in fact he was perfectly at home with people like Speedy and so on, you know, he, he, was, you know, he, he, he was he was a smart guy you know he was uh, educated after a fashion uh, he still had sort of feudalistic I ideals uh, uh, but uh, you know he was a modernizer he, he was uh, you know anyway he gets shunted off with Abdullah to the Seychelles which is you kind of think Seychelles uh, you could do with being shunted off the Seychelles right this moment couldn't you yeah you wouldn't mind uh, hanging out there well it, it wasn't it wasn't exactly a hardship uh, position but it must have been extremely irritating uh, nonetheless, uh, and he was there for 17 years before they were allowed him to get back to Singapore. And once again, he decided to just go back to Singapore and, and just be stinking rich, you know, until he died in 1881. I'll check that date. I've got that written down somewhere. 1887. There you go, 1887. Got to get these things right. Um, but a much chastened man, and um, when Isabella had turned up at... Uh, uh, this place, uh, the first thing that uh, she noticed was um, uh, Nay Ibrahim's um, wife uh, and slave girls <laughs> you know, uh, were, were there in, in a dilapidated house and, and uh, 
the finances were sounded like it was all a bit dodgy. So where do we go now? What's our next stop? All oh, right. Well, we're going to uh, go on with Isabella, uh, and she's going to meet up with um, Maharaja Layla's family. Hmm. That's going to be another exciting adventure, isn't it? Well, I'd better stop now because I've gone on for far too long about everything else. So uh, uh, like, share, subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe, 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 uh, because that's the only thing that actually makes any sense about st stats on these these things. Um, don't forget to go through all the, the others. It, it's it's quite a, you know, a, it's quite long. You, you can actually uh, read on these things uh, as well and see some of the pictures it's a, such a shame it couldn't be a documentary just imagine a documentary 90 minutes the whole thing in situ nice sound bites not me just sat here rambling and waving my arms around like a demented sock puppet uh, but that's the way it is that's the way it is it has to be and i hope you enjoyed these uh, uh this ooh, discourse that i engage in here um, and my arms are going up like this as opposed to waving around like then because uh, of the way I have to cut it to make that picture at the back look like something. I wonder what picture I'm going to put at the back there. I think it'd be Nye Ibrahim. Should be. There's a rather handsome picture I've got. It's took it at the museum. Uh, whether he looked like that or not, I do. Mm, I suspect it, it's been glammed up a bit. Uh, but even so, uh, Nye Ibrahim. Um, once again, another guy who's probably been a little bit maligned by history or ignored by history. Uh, he's, he, he was, um, uh, like I say, a, a modern thinking, forward thinking man who unfortunately got um, trapped by that traditional side of his persona. And hmm, is that what happens to politicians that cannot make that? proper transition that are completely trapped by the past and are not seeing what can happen because of the march of certain aspects of the economic basis of our world uh, demand those things to happen. Mm -hmm. Could be. Uh, it just bring me, um, perhaps I should be talking about uh, the modern silk routes. One Belt, One Road project, because we're seeing mm, quite a sea change of our uh, political landscape in the world that um, I don't think the Europeans have quite, or all the Americans have are quite getting to grips with at the moment. Um, uh, and everybody else is mm, a bit uncertain as to where the wind is blowing. Anyway, getting caught in in between these these things can be disastrous because you never know which side to leap because you never quite know where the mm, the moments are going where thing the flip of a coin go one way or the other but it always goes down it always goes one way and then it goes the other and then it goes that back well yeah, yeah history will teach you all sorts of things and uh, it won't predict the future but uh, as a rule, what happened 100 years ago, it's still happening. So anyway, there you go. Goodbye. Oh, like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Bye. See you next time. <laughs>